So I actually filmed my January favorites video two nights ago and then I edited it last night and it's still processing. I don't know why it's taking so long. I literally only cut out um, like three minutes total. I don't know why it's taking so long. So these are probably going to be up later than I thought. So this video is going to be the other things that I did in January that just aren't favorites and I'll explain for each thing as to why it isn't like a favorite. I mean, overall, it's just things that I liked um, or perhaps didn't like. So um, I'm gonna start off with a comic series that I'm reading. I just read issue 12, right? Yeah, issue 12 yesterday. Um, I'm kind of taking it slowly and it's Deadly Class by Rick Remender um, and illustrated by Wesley Craig. Currently, there are 36 issues out um, and seven volumes. I found a website, which I'll link in the description, where I'm reading the issues uh, because I heard it was going to be turned into a TV show, as well as I've been aware of this series since it came out. I just haven't gotten around to getting it or reading it. Um, so then when the when it was being adapted, I was like, I should check that out, and then I didn't, and then it was the night that the show was premiering, and I read the first four issues. So it's kind of, it's interesting to be, like, watching the show at the same time and reading the issues at the same time, because for the most part, there's a lot of similarities. It's just, like, told in a different order. So the series is about Marcus, and it takes place in... 1987, I'm pretty sure, is when it starts. Um, Marcus is homeless. He's a teenager. He's homeless. And when he was younger, his parents were killed by a um, schizophrenic jumper. Like, she jumped from a bridge or some a building or something and landed on his parents. So they all ended up dying. And uh, then he is sort of, like, initiated into this school uh, King's Dominion, that's what it's called, I'm pretty sure, and it's a school for assassins, so they train people to become world-class assassins, and Marcus's mission is to kill Ronald Reagan, because ultimately that's, that's the cause of his parents' death, because of Reagan letting out a bunch of mentally ill people, therefore his parents died. <laughs> And the other main main characters of the series are Saya, who is Japanese and has, like, tattoos. Like, they, each character sort of has a different, like, click and backstory. Uh, Saya is Japanese and she... In the comics, there's, like, a little less information about her. Like, it's, it's kind of more secretive, but there's more that has been revealed so far in the show. There's also... Oh no, I'm forgetting one of the characters' names. But he's African-American and he, like, comes from an area where gangs are prevalent. There's Maria, who is dating Chico. Chico's family has taken care of Maria from a young age because they killed her family and uh, they are part of, like, the Mexican cartel. And to be honest, I'm forgetting a lot of characters right now. Like, there's Lex, there's Petra, oh, okay, oh my god. And there's Victor and Brandy. But I feel like, so far, it, it's, like, lacking a bit. I don't know. I feel like maybe comics aren't really my thing and, like, the way that the story is told. And, like, it's not necessarily the fault of the TV show either. It's just because it's based on a comic. I don't think comics are necessarily my thing because I don't feel like I have enough character development and it's not... Like, the plot is interesting and it's, it's like, cool. But I'm not a huge fan of the sort of, like, something happens in, in issue one and then something else happens in issue two and it's each, like, like, individual stories, but then you're following the same characters. I don't know. I guess that's, like, the way a lot of TV shows are. I'm, I'm like, not necessarily a fan of those kind of shows, though, where you can pretty much watch any episode and not have to, like, 
have an entire backstory. I mean, you do have to have the backstory with this and stuff, but it still feels like each episode or each issue, I should say, it, each issue, even though the characters like go together and the storyline is ultimately connected, it also feels very separate. I don't know how well I did at explaining that. And that, so I think that's part of the reason why I... I, like, like the show, but it's definitely not a favorite, and I'm liking the comics, but again, it's not a favorite. So far, I've rated the two, I the way that I've been, um, like, cataloging them on Goodreads is by saying I've read, like, the E version of the volumes. Uh, that way I don't have, like, by the end, if I have, if I catch up with all 36 issues or however many are out, I think actually 40 issues are supposed to be out by April 16th, which is the release date of volume 8. So if I like catch up and read all that, then it, it will have looked like I read, you know, 36 to 40 books, which I haven't. Like each issue, I don't want to count each issue as a book, I'd rather it be counted as volumes basically. Because on Goodreads, I've I've rated volumes one and two both four out of five stars. I'm kind of thinking volume two I'm gonna give like three and a half, or I'm like like closer to three and a half, but but keep it at a four. Um, because I accidentally thought that I had already finished volume two when in fact I still had like two more issues to read. And those issues I didn't like as much, as well as they already like killed spoiler, I guess, they already, like, killed the main bad guy, and now I'm, like, really confused as to what's gonna happen. Um, I thought that he would be, like, prevalent throughout the entire series, but I guess not. Um, so I, I'm wondering if there are really going to be physical bad guys, or if it's really gonna be, there's a lot of, like, just struggles and, like, issues with each character, which is also really prevalent in the show, which I like, um, there's not really, like, a bad guy. Well, okay, he's still alive <laughs> in the show. Um, and, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking they're gonna either, like, keep him around for a while. I don't know, I guess that's sort of what I'm hoping, because I was like, wait, he's just, he's dead now? <laughs> um, it just, it also just doesn't feel, like, I felt the buildup, and I thought that it would keep going, and instead it was just like, he's dead, and then it was, like, over. But I wanted, like, more... I wanted more, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah. Am I... How coherent was this? I'm not exactly sure. But the uh, the TV show was on sci-fi, which... Uh, another reason why I was interested in reading the comics and then also watching the show is because sci-fi also picked up The Raven Cycle, which is a series, a book series I'm currently reading. I'm on book two. I mean, keep freaking mentioning, uh, I read the first book called The Raven Boys. Uh, the series is by Maggie Steve Otter. Uh, oh. Here's the first book. I just grabbed it. Uh, I read this back in April, and I filmed, like, a three-part discussion video series on it, uh, in November, and then, like, I haven't edited them still. I haven't edited them still. So that's going to happen <laughs> at one point. But I think it, it'll be better if I keep putting it off until I'm done with some some things for school before that way I can like edit them and kind of uh, refresh my memory on certain things that happened in this book and then continue reading the second book. Uh, yeah, so this is The Raven Boys, by the way. So yeah, Sci-Fi picked up The Raven Cycle as a series and I'm, like, really nervous about it. I, like, I want to know how well they're doing adaptations and how much... Yeah, I, I mean, I know that Deadly Class is not necessarily the best thing to compare it with because it's a comic series. And I, like, the Raven... You can't mix that around. You just can't. <laughs> but I, I like the way that they're, like, portraying the setting. And they even have included, like like, images from the comics, like, basically the comics. Oh, that's something else that I really like, though. You can really see the movement. Like, there's, in volume one, or in the first issue, there's, um, a scene where Saya, like, jumps from a car and does, like, a flip, 
and I could just like feel the movement. I could like see it. It, it was like it was like it was actually moving. So I re I really like the anima uh, animation, the uh, <laughs> the illustration style, especially because it's so different from a lot of the other comics or um, graphic novels that I've read that are more like rounded. Um, Wesley Craig uses a lot more like straight lines compared to rounded lines. Okay, I think that's enough about Deadly Class. <laughs> um, a movie that I'm just like briefly going to mention that I watched is Moonstruck from 1987. Uh, I really, I like, I like liked it, but I'm kind of confused as to why it has like, like it was nominated for like an Oscar, I think, and like Cher was nominated for for like main like lead actress, and I love Cher, <laughs> uh, but I was just sort of like. Why? I don't do it, you know? It's just one of those movies. But I do see myself, like, re-watching it. I could see it as a sort of, like, I don't really know what to watch. Maybe I shouldn't actually be watching something, but I'm going to while I work on something else. Um, I found it, like, really charming, though. Um, yeah, overall, it was just, like, charming. But I didn't quite understand, like, what was... Like, suddenly they were arguing, and then, like, suddenly they were just, like, sleeping with each other, and I'm like, you just met. <laughs> also, Moonstruck is the uh, second film that I watched this year, so that was, like, a lot earlier in January, and certain details have have faded. I do remember really liking um, Cher Cher's character's name is Loretta, and I liked Loretta's mom. I liked her. <laughs> um... Okay, but here, I am, I'm afraid I'm gonna go off on, like, a rant here, which is why I wanted to just briefly mention Moonstruck. Uh, my brother and I watched Bad Times at the El Royale, which came out last year, 2018, and this movie was terrible. <laughs> like, my, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, like, how my brother felt, but I think he was also disappointed, and ultimately he just thought it was okay, like, but the more I keep thinking about it, and I've seen a couple other people that I watch, like, say it was, like, one of their most disappointing films of the year, and I was like, yeah, it was so disappointing. I think that I, oh, I should have looked up who the director was. I don't know who directed this, but, like, I liked the directing. I liked the cinematography. It just, it seemed really promising. Okay, so what the movie is about without getting into spoilery information, like, this is the information that you get from the trailer, and up to a certain point in the film, it's uh, these four characters go to the El Royale, which is a motel that is on the border of California and Nevada. So you can either get a room on the California side or on the Nevada side. And it takes place in the 70s, but it has an opening scene from like 10 years previously where someone is burying money um, like, under the floorboards of one of the rooms, and then he gets shot and dies. So that's, like, the opening scene. And somehow, you know that that's going to be connected to things that happen later on in the film. Obviously, you're just not sure how. So, these four characters, um, I don't know... Oh my god. The one girl I'm not... Okay, I don't remember everyone's, like, names and stuff, but there's John Hamm, <laughs> uh, Jeff Bridges... Uh, Dakota Johnson, and, oh man, I, Cynthia? Oh my god, I think her name is Cynthia. She is, she was, she like won the Tony Award in The Color Purple. I'm gonna call her Cynthia, and I apologize if that's not really her name. Uh, yeah, Cynthia. That sounds right. <laughs> and there's also the one, the one guy who apparently works at this motel, so it's just one person. Uh, but then you find out that the the mirrors are two-way mirrors, and there's, like, hallways behind the mirrors where you can set up a camera and things can be filmed, like, for whatever is going on in each motel room. Uh, so that that's a great premise. And, like, again, so that opening, the, the setup, what I knew from the trailer, and just already I could tell that, like, the direction was really well done. And then it all just, like, crumbled bit by bit, and I didn't like it. 
ultimately I didn't like it. And so now I'm going to get into spoilery information. Oh, it turns out I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, get into more spoilery information here. It turns out that John Hamm's character is like a spy. He's like, he works for the CIA or something. And he's pretending to be a vacuum salesman. And Dakota Johnson's character, uh, like, kidnapped her sister from a cult. So she's trying to save her sister. But John Hamm's character uh, sees what, it, what looks like a kidnapping um, and, like, torture in a way. Um, he sees that, he finds out that there are, like, two-way mirrors and stuff, because he works for the CIA, and he's smart like that. Um, yeah, so he, he, he's found the hallway, and he's watching them from the other side of the two-way mirror, and he thinks there's, like, a kidnapping going on. And so he tries, even though he, like, contacts, like, his people, <laughs> his people at the CIA, and they're like, don't interfere with anything, he does, he does. And then what happens? He gets shot. His character dies, like, a half hour into the movie. And this is, like, a two and a half hour movie. And I was like, he was the best part. He was the best part. And then while while other things are happening, the little sister gets loose. Obviously, she, she got loose because John Hamm was like, I'm gonna save you. Not understanding the full situation that the little sister is actually, like, completely brainwashed by this cult leader. And so, she ends up calling the cult leader and, and, like, basically he comes. It just, like, takes this direction that I'm like, why is it, why is this where it's going? And then just, like, Oh, the little, like, my brother and I, like, really didn't care for this little sister. Uh, Chris Hemsworth plays the cult leader, and he was just, like, wasn't convincing. Like, also, he had his pants, I know it was, like, sort of, like, the style at the time, but he, his pants were, like, way too low, and it was, like, really distracting. Not, a, not like, in a good way that I was, like, yeah, it looked good. It was just, like, pull up your pants. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I don't think he was wearing underwear. <laughs> Again, I think that was, like, for, for, like, I don't know, he's, that was, like, the cult leader image that they were going for, I guess. Uh, I, he just also wasn't intimidating, and I don't, I just don't understand. Like, he had no, he had nothing over the other people who were in his cult and, like, following his lead, and I was just really confused. And that's, that, that's just, like, the direction that it, it took, and, like, it would have been really, really cool to, like, find out more about, like, things that the people at the hotel had, like, or the motel had filmed and, like, stuff like that. And, like, the money situation barely, I don't know. I think the best, the best part of the whole movie was John Hamm's character, but he dies, like, a half hour into it. And then, like, this relationship that kind of forms between Jeff Bridges' character and Cynthia, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, uh, their, their characters, like, sort of, they just have, like, a mutual understanding of each other and, like, respect there that I appreciated, and then also the, the guy who works at the motel was, like, this, like, young college kid or, like, teenager, maybe he was in high, I don't, I don't think he was in high school, he was probably in college, um, yeah, him, he was great, I can't remember his name, but he was a great character, <laughs> um, and but also just, like, I don't know, there were just different elements, like, added that didn't, I don't know, <laughs> I just don't know, like, it ended up being the, the kid, uh, was a soldier in Vietnam, and so he has killed a lot of people, he, he's actually, like, a really good shooter, which is, which was helpful, um, but then, like, it didn't, like, nothing else, like, came with that, it was just, like, he didn't want to kill more people and he didn't want to keep doing bad things because, like, he works at this motel and they are terrible people who, like, run the place. But, like, you don't even get to find out that sort of information. It's all about, like, this cult guy. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Yeah, um, it was just disappointing. <laughs> and there, there were some, like, surprising moments, too. Uh, yeah, it was... Like, it was well done. It just, like, doesn't have a good premise or, like, just, it, it fell apart. Just as it continued, I was like, why is this, it, 
I keep saying it, but it just, like, took a different direction, and I was like, why are we going this way? I want to go that way with the spy stuff, and, like, what else is happening with this, with this motel? Uh, there is, like, mention of, like, a tape, like, the, the money that was buried, there is also a tape that was buried with the money. And, but, like, it's not even explicit about what's on the tape, it's just like, oh, yeah, probably a politician and some somebody that is not his wife. And so I got the impression that it was implying like JFK and Marilyn Monroe. And, but my brother totally didn't know. He was like, what, what's on the tape? And I'm like, I don't know. I think it's JFK and Marilyn Monroe, but I could be completely wrong because they don't say anything about it. (laughs) Okay. I think that's... (laughs) Uh, I, I may be forgetting other things. Mm. It just, it looked so promising and like the trailer was really well done, but like, I didn't, like, don't trust the trailer. Uh, yeah. And it also, I'm not someone who, I don't think trailers are well done nowadays. They usually show way too much, way too much information or, just, like, build up this suspense and make, make things look so epic that it's, like, that's not even the right mood that should be, like, the tone of this film. I, I don't know. That's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But, but it was a trailer that I was, like, oh, this is actually a good trailer. And then it just leads you to this, like, false premise of what the movie is actually about. So, those are my thoughts at bad times at the El Royale, and I've seen other people make this joke, that it really was a bad time. Um, It was okay, but, like, my brother and I were talking over parts, and we were just like, just kill the little sister, and, like, you shouldn't have saved her, and things like that. And, like, there's also backstories to each character, and, like, again, that felt, like, really promising, and it's like, okay, this is going to be important. And then most of the time it was like, hmm... I guess not. Like, it's nice to know that information about them, but at the same time, I thought it would, like, come full circle in some way. No. Disappointing. I I, want to hear, like, other people's thoughts on this, though. Again, I had... I was just more interested in, like, the CIA and motel information. You know, why was John Hamm's character even there? I don't know. (laughs) Why was he there? Was he also looking for the tape? See, I have so many questions about this premise that I thought the movie was going to be about. It's physically right here. And this is the cult stuff that happened that I wasn't a fan of. I'm going to stop just, like, continuing on with this video, though. Uh, those are the other... Those... Hmm. Those are the other things that I uh, watched and read in January that were not favorites, um, but I either liked or didn't like. <laughs> Uh, Yeah, I want to know specifically if you've seen Bad Times at the El Royale. What did you think of that? That's it for this video. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in my next one. Bye.